Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on October 12th from First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. And we are here to go through our daily lectionary reading for today and to discuss it and to say a prayer and hopefully uh, hear from what the Lord might be telling us today and how we could encourage one another and you who are watching. So let me open this in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you have provided for us. And Lord, again, we are grateful for your word to us, that we might hear from you, be transformed into the people that you would have us to be. So I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in all we do and say here, and that the community of faith would be built up. We thank you and we praise you. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Today we are going to start with Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. A short passage from Hosea chapter 13 today, just verses 1 through 3. When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. And now they keep on sinning and make a cast image for themselves, idols of silver made according to their understanding, all of them the work of artisans. Sacrifice to these, they say. People are kissing calves. Therefore, they shall be like the morning mist or like the dew that goes away early like chaff that swirls from the threshing floor, or like smoke from a window. Our passage from Acts today is chapter 27, verses 9 through 26. Since much time had been lost and sailing was now dangerous, because even the fast had already gone by, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I can see that the voyage will be with danger and much heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Since the harbor was not suitable for spending the winter, the majority was in favor of putting to sea from there, on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix where they could spend the winter. It was a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest. When a moderate south wind began to blow, they thought they could achieve their purpose, so they weighed anchor and began to sail past Crete, close to the shore. But soon, a violent wind, called the Northeaster, rushed down from Crete. Since the ship was caught and could not be turned head-on into the wind, we gave way to it and were driven. By running under the lee of a small island called Cotta, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After hoisting it up, they took measures to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run on to Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and so were driven. We were being pounded by the storm so violently that on the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard, and on the third day with their own hands they threw the ship's tackle overboard. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and, a, and no small tempest raged, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and thereby avoided this damage and loss. 
I urge you now to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor, and indeed God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we will have to run aground on some island. The gospel text today is from Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. Then Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Jesus said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you, as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. Now Herod, the ruler, heard about all that had taken place, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the ancient prophets had arisen. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he tried to see him. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. He took them with him and withdrew privately to a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawing to a close, and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there were about five thousand men. And Jesus said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of about fifty each. They did so, and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven, and blessed, and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate, and were filled. What was left over was gathered up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. And our psalm is Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion on the far far north, the city of the great king. Within its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Then the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, pains as of a woman in labor, as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have also seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go all around it, count its towers, consider well its ramparts, go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generations that this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. And our final psalm today is Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety.
These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, before we start today, I just kind of wanted to, <laughs> a little quick aside, that, that line that you read from Psalm 48, I know, that I know. the I east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, get it right. <laughs> the, 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 the tongue twists that sometimes occur, and it's just, uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, I find that in our translations, there are places where I think the, the Hebrew translators actually uh, write it well poetically to try to keep with alliterations that probably do occur in either the Hebrew or the Greek, but they, I think they would like to do things sometimes. like that. So sometimes, yeah, the structure. Sometimes right. I added a word in there somewhere. I put it also, and, I was, and then I was like, that wasn't really there. It was all right. I just like <laughs> shatters the ships of Tarshish. I thought it was good. Well, uh, so um, I think once again, we with the the variety of texts. Uh, I know, I know, I regularly talk, we regularly talk about this. Just looking at the different texts and to see how they uh, can relate to one another. Um, I'm thinking at this point we've got this story in Acts. We've been in Acts for a while where Paul is it's describing Paul's uh, final part of his missionary journey. Right. He had been arrested, but it was actually the Romans that were protecting right. him from the marauding, you know, right. the, the Jews that were trying to kill him. And now... Um, Paul is actually on his way to Rome, and he's on this ship, and the ship is sailing, but they got a late start, and right. so the, the, the winter storms are coming, and Paul encourages them to stay. Hey, we're too late. Let's stay. And they go, you know, uh, the, the comment that was made that the centurion paid no mind to Paul, but paid more attention to the pilot of the ship and to the owner of the ship who were like, hey, we got to sail because we've got a deadline to meet or something, or we've right. got this cargo that needs to be delivered. And it just kind of makes me think that uh, why in the world would uh, Luke, who's the author of Acts, include these seemingly mundane details of this story? Right. Um, and it's just kind of made me think, again, of how God is involved in really every aspect of our lives. Right. That yes, this is about Paul. And yes, Paul is a uh, follower of Jesus and Paul is, you know, huge in the Christian church, but but God is aware of every little aspect that goes on with his life. Right. He understands that the people that he's interacting with have their commercial and monetary uh, uh, goals mm -hmm. in mind. Uh, and uh, and even that though is is not. I mean, even that is 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 included in the story. In fact, leads to this kind of disaster that they face. And as like the owner of the ship is thinking, "Hey, I've got this precious cargo." The centurion escorting his prisoners. Eh, whatever. I don't really care. Right. I want to make my got money. A job to do. I've got a job to do. And, and it's fascinating to me how um, all of that precious cargo ends up getting thrown overboard. Lost. Lost. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, and Paul continues to pray and hear from God. And, and we can even assume is you know, interceding for the people on the ship. He's, right. You know, he, he's, he's a bound prisoner on his way to Rome. And yet he stands up and says, hey... Uh, here's where we are. Right. Here's what you should do. You know, e even the weird that that line. You should have listened to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I told I you. I told you. Um, it's like, come on, Paul. It's like I wonder sometimes if there's, you know, if Paul is human, right? Paul okay. probably had his frustrations. Paul's probably like, I appeal to Caesar. Okay, we're going to Caesar, but you know, you should have listened to me. Um, just how real as a as a human being this story makes it out to be. How right. the conflicting values. Paul obviously wants to share the gospel. The owner of the ship wants to make a profit. The centurion wants to deliver his prisoner, you know, presumably alive. Everybody on the ship wants to, to be stay alive. alive. Right. And how that's all within God's providence. Right. And through all of that and through this storm, God is able, or excuse me, Paul is able to then share the gospel. Right. The God I follow. Right. The God I trust. Right. We will be delivered. There will be no life lost. And, and he speaks mm. um, words of truth because 
the angel appeared. So, you know, God revealed this to him. So it's not just wishful truth. thinking of all right. that. He's, yes. He was, he was told this. And so you have God, uh, you have whew, words, um, you have Paul willing to speak truth based on what God tells him. And so, which required trust on his part. I mean, he's already, I mean, yes, the Romans have him. He is a prisoner. But that's what got him in this whole mess in the first place, <laughs> was sharing the gospel. So he is right. still, he has enough courage mm -hmm. to still stand up, speak truth, speak gospel, and this whole scenario, this whole situation, the mundane details. But that is actually allowing him to share the gospel. Right. And right. so. Right. Paul continues to keep the first things, the first things. Right. What is the most important thing here? Well, the God whom I serve, who has called me to do these things, I'm going to do them. Right. And so we get, the, oh, sorry. You were oh, no, I was just, I, I did go ahead, finish your thought, and then I'll. Oh, I was going to jump into Luke 9. But okay, yeah, before you do that. Yeah. So it's interesting. You said, you know, keep the first things first. You know, what if the story was different? What if Paul said, you know, hey, God said he's going to deliver us. And they're like, oh, okay. And they just sit back and they just, you know, whatever. But everything had to be lost first. Mm -hmm. So that monetary value, that monetary gain had to be tossed overboard. Mm -hmm. And so the end of this story, can you imagine the stories that the people that were on the ship, you know, all was lost except for us. Whereas if they had been safely delivered, it's like, oh, well, you know, our good sailing or this, that, or the other, or this... Their earthly goals were not accomplished. The ship was lost. The cargo was lost. But in that, there was a God who delivered. Right. And so because all of that was lost, that is the only narrative that comes out of this right. story. The gospel is the standing narrative. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you jumped in there. To, to That was great. Now, you, now you've, you've made me redirect now. I was going to jump <laughs> to Luke. Sorry. No, no, it's totally good because I think this is, this is why we do this in community, right? Because, uh, you know, it, it, it's good to read and, and think and pray and ponder. But I think this is why we do things together is, uh, yeah, we need to learn from each other. And so I think that actually makes a great part to jump back to our brief Hosea reading today, um, where, uh, again, in three short verses, they talk about that uh, the, the people of Ephraim were casting silver images, idols that they were worshiping. Um, and one of, one of the things about... Uh, um, you know, silver was still a precious metal, but it was one of these ways that, um, what I understand, even the the in the temple of, um, gosh, I'm looking at after who was in it, uh, in the Parthenon on in Athens, they it was actually used as a treasury. It was a storehouse. So they've got this big statue um, of of Athena in Athens and when they had gold or when they had silver they would fashion it into um, little plates that they would then hang on to the statue and that was a central place it was guarded it was their bank it was their repository not only was it an idol in the literal sense of the word but their material wealth got placed there as well um, and so here's Ephraim they're making silver idols and sacrifice to these. And so uh, even back in the day, you know, materialism was rampant. They were more interested in their money frequently than they were in uh, an understanding of an eternal relationship with a transcendent God. Here's something tangible. Here's something I can hold. Here's my money. It is quite literally their idol. But I'm telling you, they if they had need to spend it, they would, you know, here's a piece of silver. Right. Uh, and so in a very literal and figurative sense, they were worshiping material wealth. They were right. worshiping not just a, a cast idol, which was, is, you know, but again, it's that idea of money right. being. And so, and how that verse three, they're going to be like the morning mist that, goes away early like the dew or the chaff that swirls on the threshing floor or like smoke from a window. No matter how secure you think you've got it, 
it's not lasting. It's fleeting. I mean, can you collect dew? Can you collect smoke? Can you collect any of those things? Right. You can't. Right. They're Worthless so set on being being able to collect and display and all of that, but yet it is, it's... Right. Like you said, worthless right. and fleeting. It's, there's so I think that's a great connection between the Acts passage and Hosea. And, and, and you know it happens today. You know that there are people, well, we are all tempted. Right. Every one of us. I know it's, it's important to balance your checkbook, right? <laughs> right? But how often do we go, ooh, I'm doing pretty good this month, or oh, man, I'm really struggling this month. Whatever it might happen to be, right. where are we in our real trust? Are we keeping first things first, or are we putting too much confidence in our material success? Um, and that, I think, is then a good segue to, 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 the, Luke, Luke. to the gospel passage. Um, when, when Jesus tells the disciples to go out and have authority over the demons and to cure the diseases, what does he say to them in verse 3? Take nothing for your journey. No staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. And that's that's a that's a that's a hard that's a hard word. That's yes. like who goes out on a journey with, with nothing? nothing. Last road trip we took <sighs> two hours to pack and get everything <laughs> together. Right, There's a lot of kids we right? got to pack for. Right, I mean we went for I don't know like one night. We had to pack all the stuff. Right, for one night and. Get in the back of the car. I didn't do it till the morning we were leaving. It literally took me two hours. Get every step together. Get the car. Like two hours from the time we started packing until we get in the car. Leave with nothing. Leave with nothing. Um, I I know I've said it to my kids, to my family before. You know, yes, I pack what I think I'm going to need. But then I always say, but if I don't have everything I need, I still have a credit card. You know, it's like I can. I will buy. They have Walmarts there. Right, right, right. They do. <laughs> they have a Walmart. <laughs> Let, let's, let's face it. We have access to pretty much everything. And then, but but I understand it's, it's, in this context, it's a little bit different because he's sending them out specifically to do ministry things. Right. Uh, where complete and total dependence on Jesus is required. The trust aspect was the first thing. When, as we were reading right. through that, and, and when you read that um, passage, um, and when it said, take nothing with you, that was the first thing that came to mind, was this trust aspect. But even in the Acts passage, you see the trust that Paul had to exhibit. Mm. And then, you know, we didn't, it stopped at the, hey, you're going to have to run the ship aground. But even that would take a trust aspect. I mean, okay, like, right. so... We're going to crash this That's thing. That's going to sink the ship, right? Right. And so, and ultimately that is, you know, what happens. But um, that was the first thing that caught my attention as we were reading. Even the disciples gathered the, the fish and the loaves. And and you had to, they had to be like, are you crazy? How in the world is this going to work? But yet they did it. Right. They did it. Right. They, so, they went and did it. Uh, we see a distinction between their obedience and then Herod's perplexity. Mm -hmm. Again, this is post uh, the execution of John the Baptist, but here's this ruler, and we all know that Herod was probably one of the richest men that ever lived on the face of the planet, and here he he doesn't quite understand. He's hearing these stories about Jesus, and he's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, understand. he's just some random itinerant preacher going around doing all these things. Like, how can he do all these things without without authority, without power, without riches, without all the army, without all these things that Herod possesses, and yet Herod is unable to do the things that yes. Jesus is doing. And he's right. like, is this John the Baptist come back to life? Is this Elijah? Is this one of the other Old Testament prophets? And he doesn't get it. I do always find it curious that, like in this right here, it's like, is this John the Baptist come back from the dead? And yet Jesus did come back from the dead? And they didn't, you know, it's just funny how they, this idea, this concept of returning from the dead, that he puts it out there, is John the Baptist alive? But yet, Jesus did come back from the dead, and they still didn't right. recognize that. So it's funny that they would try to assign that to Old Testament prophets or to right. to John. Right. And yet Jesus did it. <laughs> That's Something always new is happening here. Right. But it wasn't, yeah. 
even the raising from the dead wasn't sufficient. Right, mm -hmm. for some. For some. And so, I didn't mean to take you off. Oh, no, 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 that's, no, 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 I like that. I totally. Right. Um, but even like the apostles, you know, they, he sends them out to cast out demons and stuff. Trust. They had to trust had that to he trust. said, you will be able to do this. So the call to trust, yes, and then when they return, then you know the whole this this feeding of the five thousand, as Luke describes it, it's uh, they return. Jesus asks them to, hey, let's go to a private place and let's you know rest, let's debrief, let's talk about it, let's talk about what you, where your trust uh, uh, resulted in, whatever it might happen to be. But then the crowd comes again. A ministry opportunity takes place. And here's, here's how Jesus then demonstrates, well, again, this is how I, this is why I sent you out mm -hmm. without all of these things, because I can provide for you. Um, and so I think the reason, you know, again, the writers, the gospel writers, they, they put stories in certain places in order to emphasize certain points. And so, we get the ministry of the twelve. We get it contrasted with the perplexity of of the rulers, and then we get a demonstration of Christ's power to provide. And I think those the, those three things together uh, are are giving us an indication of what Jesus believes to be important in ministry. Um, trust trust in Him. It's right. I think really what it boils down to because we see that in all of the things. Don't be like Ephraim, putting your trust in idols. Don't be like Herod, putting your trust in idols. Right. <laughs> Don't be like the ship captain, you know, putting your trust in idols. Right. Put your trust in God. Right. He provides, he protects, he resurrects. Right. Hmm. Good stuff. So I think the, the ongoing challenge for all of us, Natalie, um, you know, what does this mean in our day in, day out lives? Uh, how do we how do we fully trust in, in Jesus to be everything that we need him to be? You know, I think the entire world, the whole culture is giving us a contrary message. Absolutely. It's yes. What you can do. And we are, yeah, what you can do. We are living in the midst of it. Every one of us is being challenged um, to, you know, to accumulate, to fight for your rights, to whatever might happen right. to be. Um, and I think, you know, I, I love Psalm 4, um, just that, you know, those questions that are asked in, in verse two, you know, how long you people shall my honor suffer shame, or how long will you love vain words and seek after lies? And and I think it's just uh, right if if we are not honoring God with our lives, uh, we are you know dishonoring Him, uh, and then and then we suffer shame <laughs> as a result of that. Uh, but even that, even that verse four commandment, when you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. I think you know verses four and five of Psalm four. Um, you know, God is the one who provides. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. You know, you can chase, you can chase after the rich and you can chase after their blessings. You know, their Grain and wine, yeah, they'll wine you and dine you, but the light of the Lord puts more gladness in our heart than those ever could. Right, and back to the Hosea, they are fleeting. Mm -hmm. It's smoke and window. Mm -hmm. It's dew on the ground, gone as quickly as it comes. How regularly we need to be reminded of that. Anything else you want to add? I'm sure if we read it again tomorrow, we'd find something new. <laughs> I guarantee you, probably similar. I don't think we were too far off today, no, but, so uh, but again, but something think, new. Yeah, I feel good uh, about that. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, how many times have we read Psalm 147 verses 1 through 11? But every time you read it, typically when you right. read it, I'm like, yeah. There's something in there that there's speaks something in to there you that speaks. Each. Right. Yeah. Right.
I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. Yeah, what more could you really want? Yeah. You want to say a prayer to close this out? I'd be happy okay. to. Gracious Father, thank you for your words to us today. Um, I pray that you um, open our hearts and open our ears to hear the words that you have for us. I pray that you reveal um, your truth in your word to us as, as we read through um, the Bible. I pray that um, as truth is revealed to us, that we can trust, we can trust the words that you say to us. We can trust the provision that you provide for us. Um, you are where we find our rest and our comfort. And we thank you for that. Um, as we trust, I pray that we take, uh, we look and then we take opportunities in the everyday, in the mundane, in the difficult times, in the unknown times, I pray that we look for opportunities to share your word with others around us and that we speak the true words of the gospel to those around us, that we can share um, your love and that we can glorify you in those times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. If you do have any questions or concerns, please do feel free to call up to the church and we'd be happy to listen to you and pray with you. Um, we've got a lot of good things coming up in these next couple months here at church. Uh, we're getting relatively close to the Advent season, but we've got Thanksgiving and things coming up. So we've got a new members class on Sunday. If you're interested in joining, please, uh, please do so. And we'd be happy to uh, get to know one another better as we walk through these uh, journeys of faith. But thanks very much for watching, and I hope you guys have a blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye.